Welcome, Lori, to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled. Thank you. I am so excited to interview you. I've never had someone on the podcast to talk about chores and reframe how we view chores and the family roles. And this is something that I find so many moms that have tweens and teens struggle with. And I also want you to share a little bit about your book that, is it today that you're releasing it? It was yesterday. It was yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll give a little, uh, for the, for anyone watching, here's the cover. Yay. Our home, the love, work, and heart of family. So awesome. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That is just a huge accomplishment to thank you to write so about. much. So before we launch in, I just want you to start by sharing a little bit of your story. You have quite a backstory about your experience and uh, and what led you to what you're doing today, working with families and writing this book. Yeah, thank you so much. So for me, it was really um, an instance, a personal instance of experiencing the societal devaluing of unpaid work or uh, domestic labor as, you know, and there's many different things to call it, invisible work, the work of care. Uh, and, um, you know, to take it a, a step back further, I had a 15-year career in marketing, which I loved and thrived in. And um, when my first son was born, I was living in Canada. We had a lovely year-long maternity leave, which I really sank into and and um, was was thriving in that and and enjoyed. But when the t time came to go back to work, I was you know excited to try to figure out that balance and whatnot. Um, I approached the company that I was with at the time, and this was you know coming up on fourteen years ago. They were not offering the flexibility that would have worked for me. And so I thought, okay, let's go all in on this um, economy of care focus uh, out of the economy of commerce for a bit and pivot my passions and my contributions and all of that that I was so passionate about to focusing on my family and my community. And I loved that. And we had the opportunity after my second child to travel internationally. We made a move to London, England from Toronto. Um, and I just went all in on volunteering for schools and being on boards of charities and all of these things that I thought were contributing, that I knew I was um, growing from and making an impact and that, you know, my family was, was feeling a halo benefit from as well. We moved second time to Chicago. And every time we move, we need to renew all of our sort of personal foundational documents, wills, insurance, whatnot. And when we got to Chicago, it was, it was just our little family unit, the four of us. We didn't know anybody. We don't have any family here, any safety net. And my husband said to me, you know what? If anything were to happen to you, I would have to take a leave from work and head up the family. That's how much he valued the role. Mm -hmm. um, and so he said, let's get you disability insurance, like worst case. So I went through all the rigmarole of uh, applications for disability insurance, only to be told by this insurance agent in middle America that because I was just a housewife, I didn't fall on his algorithm, that my thousands of hours of care of my family and my community, because they did not generate a salary, if anything were to happen to me, there was no tangible loss. And I looked at this man incredulously. And what he said to me that day really let me, let me on fire. And what it sparked in me was this need to understand on a broader level how it can be that all of this work that that women are doing, we know globally that women carry 75% of the load of unpaid care, whether you are fully focused on it in the home or working outside the home, women are still carrying the load. How he could hear me tell him all the things that I am doing and tell me that there was no value to that. And beyond this gentleman, you know, looking at society, looking at the economic indicators like GDP, 
this work of care isn't counted. So I began to write about it. I began to study, I began to network with other people, mostly women who were doing work to sort of bring visibility to this sort of societal ill. And I looked at this incredible work that these other women were doing, you know, to impact social policy, to impact corporate policy, government policy. And I looked at my own platform at the time and I thought, gosh, I'd love to get involved. I'm so fired up. But as a stay-at-home mom at that point, I just, I didn't have the platform. I didn't have a small business or anything to sort of fly out of the nest from. And I thought, what can I do? Where does my credibility lie? And I, I, I realized I can talk to children with my 12 years at the time experience, looking after my own kids, being involved in their schools, being involved in children's charities. This is where I felt I could really have an impact. I may not be able to touch the current generation of partners, employers, but I can touch the next. And so this book was born, Our Home. Wow. I love that story. I'm just like, wow. And I, when I read first about how passionate you are, it just lit this passion and you use the word unpaid work. And I never heard that before. Is, is that something yeah. that I have just missed that word? Is that a, you know, I think as we sort of begin to raise the consciousness and raise awareness, we have been sort of hearing labels and definitions so many of them, right? To describe this, it's, um, you know, unpaid work, the work of care, unpaid labor, invisible labor, the mental load, the second shift. I mean, depending on sort of what specifically you're referring to, there are so many ways, that, which just goes to show you, right, the load that we're carrying. Um, and then, you know, you talk about the mental load, right? So much of this work that we do as women is, invisible, not yeah. only because the executional work is sort of done silently and magically and behind the scenes and when kids are at school or when they're sleeping or whatever, but it's also invisible because so much of it is cognitive and emotional. And we just carry this, right? Like all the noticing, all the remembering, all the reminding, everything, this ticker tape that runs incessantly through our mind because we have taken on and because it has been expected yes. of us by society to be the the key and core supporters of our of our family's well-being. And so we carry that with us at all times and you know really it's become a wellness issue for women. You, you see 80% of autoimmune diseases are diagnosed in women. Women are twice as likely to report stress and and anxiety and depression um, and this is in large part why yeah. I mean, I just think how undervalued and I mean, you just saw it right there when you're a meeting, uh, meeting with, was he, what was his role again? He was an insurance guy, right? An insurance, an insurance agent. Yep. Trying wow. to sell me, uh, all kinds of stuff. And it's crazy because how we can feel undervalued as well. And whether you're working out of outside of the home, whatever that, that is, whatever our listeners are doing, how undervalued we can feel or how guilty we can feel that we're always falling short That's and right. we're not doing enough. And when it comes to your book and chores, and then you were talking about the wellness, there's such a mind shift when I was reading the book and when I was listening to you, that was so refreshing, was so life-giving. I was telling my husband, I'm so excited to interview uh, this woman, Lori Sugarman today, because I have never heard anybody talk about it this way. Oh, and so, thank you. yeah. So talk to us about, you don't really like the word chores and tell us why. So I think it's a tricky word because if you look at the definition, right, it's it's a downer. And if we're, <laughs> this, let's just start it's here. It's exhausting chores, like something right? we have to do. This, this, is, this is work that isn't going anywhere. So our opportunity here is to change how we look about it, how we think about it, and how we talk about it with our kids, especially, you know, teens and tweens trying to get them engaged. We have 
got to reframe how we look at this. And the definition of the word chore is work that is tedious and difficult and repetitive and annoying, right? And well, if I was 13, I wouldn't want anything to do with that either. And so the opportunity is really to say, actually, guys, this is the work of our of our family wellness. This is the work of gratitude for all that we have. This is the work of all of us. It's not women's work. It's not mom's work. And also, this is the work of, of connection and an opportunity for us to to partner and pair and empower each other. And I just think we're, we're likely not going to find a new word for it, but if we can change the energy with which we refer to this, and instead of looking at that mound of laundry, which don't get me wrong, like laundry, and I saw this, a great post on your, on your Instagram about laundry being sort of like the never ending cycle, right? There's always laundry to wash. Yes, because we have lived, because we have played, you know, because we have had ice cream and and it dripped on our shirt, because there was soccer practice and there's grass stains. I mean, yes, there's lots of laundry, but it's it's because we are thriving and and thankfully we are. And thankfully we have a washing machine in our house if we're lucky, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and access to be able to get the stains off. And so it's all how you look at it. And also laundry is an opportunity for empowering and teaching. I have a, an 11 year old who is the chief laundry folder in my house and he has never learned to dread it because he's been my partner and my shadow for as long as I can remember in the laundry room. The, his first fascination was with the little lint catch <laughs> and the dryer. He was like, what is that? And he went on YouTube and found that you can make paper with dryer lint. And, and so he never learned to see it as something to be dreaded. It's just like a part of how we roll, a part of how we flow as a family, a part of the stuff that needs to get done to keep us healthy and safe, to keep us nourished and, and nurtured and to protect our investments like this home, like our car, you know, that is so well used. And so again, our, our language is, is so core to making this shift to any child of any age being willing to sort of come into this work and understand that it is for all of us. I love thinking of it like gratitude for what we have for the things that we have, caring, connection. Mm -hmm. And you've told that story about your son. And rather than just saying, um, I've got to go fold laundry, you know, don't bother me kind of, I'm going to go fold laundry. You talked about how he hung out with you. Exactly. And so seeing yeah. things as an opportunity for connection in a positive way and doing chores together and, um, you know, I think about uh, the moms that I work with and with the tweens and teens, it's, there's so much pushback and it's like, oh, you know, they don't want to do it. You, you try and, you know, ask sure. them to do it. And yep. it's, it's easier. So many moms will tell me, you know, and I relate to this. Oh, it's just so much easier to do myself because right. uh, you even say asking for, we ask for help. So how can we, how can we use different language? You're really good at that, of reframing things to our kids that will help them want to join us and come on board. So you just said so many important things and I was writing them down <laughs> and I, I hope to touch on all of them. But the, the, the first, the first really sort of core concept is we have this opportunity now we're shifting away from this, like I, because I told you so concept of parenting, right? The opportunity is to shift into this because we agreed to approach to family flow. And what I recommend, and when I'm, I'm also a, a, a family coach, I, I really help families get unstuck in this way by offering them systems and language to sort of um, I say I'm like the WD-40 for families sometimes when they're just <laughs> feeling really like they're feeling like, ah, oh, I got to get out of this, like this groove that we're in. And I, I really want to flow better. And um, where I think it's a great place to start is with a little sit down with your family, just to say, guys, we maybe haven't talked about this before, but 
what are we, what are our core values as a family? You know, we live in, in, in this little unit. We share this space. We move through life together. We make all of these agreements and negotiations every day. We, we provide so much support for one another, but it's going so fast. Like we're, we're just trying to keep up with it, right? To, to stop and say, wait a sec, what are we trying to achieve as individuals, as a unit? What's important to us? What is not important to us that we can actually release and free up some space, focus on really what is, and then agree as a family on your core values. And the opportunity to invite kids of all ages into this conversation can be really, really powerful because very often kids are like receiving direction, but they're not invited to really express. Mm -hmm. And so I know you talk about this all the time and it shows an opportunity for the kids to feel really trusted. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you open to the door for them to be really heard and express what they need to thrive, where they need support, where they're struggling, what they feel they have to offer others, then what happens is you have this North Star as a family that you can always come back to. Because of course you're going to like get stuck again or fall off the tracks or whatever, but then you know, wait a second, when we sat down and and feel free to sit down as many times as you need, right? And, and rejig things as things change. But when, when we sat down and agreed to no, no, this is where we want to be as a family. You can always come back to that. And from there, you begin to understand what it takes on a daily basis to achieve those goals. And then you can begin to carve out how everyone can participate. And so when children have a stake in setting the objectives for your family, they also have a stake in what's going to bring you to that success. I love that. And I teach a lot on how important it is to get our tweens and teens involved in the conversation because they they are wanting to be more independent. They are pulling away. And if we're going from that, I love how you say that I told you so, yeah. and we were nagging them to do it, to get it done, you know, and then we end up yelling and losing it because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. It is so different when you shift to that, having a conversation and including them in that process of what are our values and do you even recommend that um, caregivers ask like, what is it that you would like to do that you would enjoy doing to have that conversation? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, you want kids to feel like they're succeeding in whatever they're contributing to the home. And what really, really helps is to match them to a skill that you know they feel good about. So I have one child who has great organizational skills. So I invite him to come and unload the groceries and stock the pantry. It's something that feels easy to him. He's able to complete it. And he not only feels good about it, but he's building that muscle to sort of continue to improve along those lines. I have my older son. He loves listening to music. So he chooses the tasks around the house where he can have his headphones on and, you know, like something like vacuuming where he's moving, right? That feels, um, like something that's that's not annoying or that's not a struggle to complete. So it's really important to understand like, yeah, your kids should match to these tasks so that they can feel like they're contributing in a meaningful way and feel that pride um, within themselves. And then the other thing that I find helpful in connecting kids to a task is that they really understand the why behind it. So yeah. it's not about presenting our kids with like a chore chart or a to-do list that's just sort of, you know, ominously existing in space, but to frame it with the context for why all these tasks are important to our health and safety or protecting our investments. And for teens and tweens, you know, it's as simple as saying to my son, uh, a shift from saying, oh, you have to change your sheets today, to which he will groan, right? (laughs) But if I say it this way, hey, babe, um, I was reading that having a clean pillowcase is really important for having clear skin. 
I was thinking maybe we could change your sheets maybe once a week. What do you think? I can help you. I can show you how to wash them. I can show you how to fold a fitted sheet. This is a life skill that like, for some reason, no one has developed a better fitted sheet yet. I don't know why. Maybe this is my next project. Um, but just teaching them these life skills and doing it together and providing them with that context of, of clear skin, suddenly you see they're bought in. Um, you know, my, my older son too, he, he has a collection of concert t-shirts that are important to him. Um, he went to the Travis Scott concert. He has this really cool t-shirt. He spilled spaghetti sauce on it. I could have taken the shirt and washed it, but instead I brought him into the laundry room with me. And I said, okay, take the stain spray. Here's what you do. Spray it. We'll probably leave it for 10 minutes. Let's come back to it. You can probably wash this shirt with the following other things. Okay. You don't want to put this thing in with it. And here's why. And when you pull it out of the washing machine, you have to like straighten the seams and hang it on the thing. And he was like, oh, okay. If I had shown him this about like my clothes or something, I don't know. It probably would have gone right over his head. He would have been thinking about something else. But because it was something that was important to him, he was like, yeah, like I want to understand how to care for this. Um, and now he knows. And part of this parenting, right, you know, we so often want to protect our, our tweens and teens from distractions, from, you know, their, their focus on academics and their focus on extracurriculars. And because they're close to, you know, those college applications and and they need to be focused on their own excellence and achievement. But we forget sometimes that we're also preparing them for, for college living and being independent, right? And knowing how to keep a healthy space for themselves and knowing how to nourish themselves on, on a daily basis. And so preparing them to be independent and of course, eventually solid partners is such a big part of the opportunity with the tasks of the home. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You said so many things. And, and one thing that stood out to me is like, you're looking for opportunities to, to connect. So rather than like, Oh, I've got to teach this. Like even that feels heavy, like I've got to teach them and I'm not teaching them. And so therefore I'm failing, Right. But I, you know, connecting, like you had him come in and you showed him how to do it. So that's an opportunity where you connected with him and it was around something he cared about. That's it. Yeah. Or his fit, you know, I mean, tweens and teens, they, they care about their skin, you know, their skin's starting to break out. And by Absolutely. explaining that to them, it's like, I care about you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you, this, this impacts your skin, if you're sleeping on a, on a dirty pillowcase, I mean, chances are that's going to speak to them a lot more loudly than you know, you need to change your sheets. Exactly. And it's important that, you know, they feel like a personal benefit, that they understand the personal benefit. You know, another example that I sometimes use is um, with the family car, right? Mm -hmm. Especially as kids begin to come of age to take it on their own, right? It's really important for kids to understand how cars are valued and how the maintenance of a car impacts its long-term trade-in or, or resale value because any extra money that the family will generate from that goes back to benefit them. And so if I'm talking to little kids, I might explain to them that like not leaving all of our snacks on the floor or banana peels, like between the seats or whatever it is, um, is, you know, if we can keep a clean car, a healthy car, in five years, when we go to trade it in or sell it, like our family will have, even if you say $50 more, a hundred dollars yes. more, right? They feel that that's something that they can work towards. And then what does that hundred dollars like mean for the family for, t for tweens and teens, right? They can understand it at a more sophisticated level. And so just to provide that context for why we do all these important things and, and again, making them visible, right? Not doing all the work silently and magically, but like doing it a little, like a little bit more loudly so that your kids are aware of, of how much you're contributing. Yeah. And it, it sort of flames their curiosity. Yes. Well, and that's one of the things I was saying to my husband is like, just pride in what we have and like being good stewards of what we have and also sharing care for each other. Because yes. resentment is such a big thing. It's huge. 
for moms doing 75%. Like I didn't know what the statistic was on that 75%. And so we're walking around resent, resentful. Yeah. And, and you even have a different reframe for help. And I thought that was so interesting. Like, yes. will you come help me? Which I'm always saying to moms and I'm going to have to change yeah. this. Like we yeah. don't even let our needs be known. That's we don't. It ask for help oftentimes because we, and, but yet we're walking around, you know, kind of, you know, tossing around the pots and pans in the kitchen. Cause we're angry. We're doing it all. We're exhausted. And, yeah. And so I'm, I'm saying, you know, we need to say, Hey guys, I need some help, but you have a reframe for that. And well, yeah, yeah. explain that. Cause I thought so that was is- a real aha moment. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so great. So this is another opportunity for a shift, right? It, if you think about the word help, like it actually sounds really lovely to say, oh, I have a husband who helps me or, you know, my kids are so helpful around the house. But what that really implies is that the work is is yours and that there are folks waiting in the wings for you to call them in. That <laughs> means that the the oh load, that means a load still sits on your shoulders that you are somehow, you know, and we believe this in society, right? That women are, are wired to do this work better and, and are obligated to show up to provide this as a labor of their, their love. Um, but really the magic is in division of labor and in full ownership of tasks being divided among family members. So it's not about mom owning and carrying and other people helping, but about empowering other family members with a complete understanding of what needs to be done so that they can fully own the task and the delivery of the task without you needing to say, I need help to remind, to do, to nag, right? The repetition of the asking, which is also not fair to moms who are typically doing it. And so this is not like a light switch for your family. This is something that you grow into with a lot of conversation and the establishment of some really good systems, but what you can get to, and it's very efficient and it allows you to release so much of that stress and resentment are systems where, you know, your teenager might own cooking for the family every Wednesday. And they fully understand what that means. They decide what's on the menu. They make that decision knowing everybody's preferences, allergies, aversions, who has practice and needs to eat late, whatever it is. They understand how to procure the ingredients or they know that they need to add to your grocery list by a certain time what they need. And then they create a meal that they feel confident in delivering to the family. And so this is something that you can grow into. As I mentioned before, my 11 year old has laundry responsibilities that he knows are his. He doesn't ask me. He just knows to go when, when the towels and the socks and the underwear are on top of the dryer, that means they're ready for him. He grabs them and takes them without needing to be reminded without the nagging, whatever. And he, the, the other thing I should say is he watches Premier League soccer highlights while he folds the laundry. So, Uh you know, there's this great opportunity to pair it with something that you enjoy to like make the time go faster. And then, you know, he doesn't even think about it really because he's engaged in something that's fun for him and multitasking. So I think if we can shift away from, can you help me to a model where the family members are really empowered to like, own. And of course it should be safe and age appropriate for them. And of course it's with the support of parents, you know, while you're transitioning into that full ownership, but you know, this is a a great opportunity for partners, for partners too. garbage is a great example. Garbage and taking out the trash and the recycling is a great one for one person in the family to own completely. And that would involve taking all the little mini garbages from all the bathrooms, understanding how frequently garbage is taken out in your community, understanding where the supply of replacement trash bags are and where to write it down if more are needed, et cetera. And so it really empowers that person to, and they feel trusted to do the role. And then mom, as we've been talking about, Mm -hmm. can fully release it. And I should say 
yes, this is a very gendered conversation we're having because most of the research that that shines a light on these conflicts comes from male female partnerships. Um, we don't see as much of a struggle, obviously, in same sex relationships with with the the gendering of this work and these roles. Um, and so it's really, really an opportunity to put systems into place and empower with full ownership. This is just blowing my mind <laughs> like, because I have, it's like we train our families, right? And I've trained my family. It's almost like training them. This is my job and they're doing me such a favor mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. they're helping me. Right. And I, and it's like, I have to be so appreciative and, you know, oh, thank you so much. I mean, right. that, you know, it's kind of that mindset. Yes, for a sure. A older generation yeah. than you are. And, um, and shifting our system and to thinking more about how to empower, how to own, how to get them to own completely that this is their job and releasing. I love that. Owning, getting members of the family to own, and then releasing it as having to be our responsibility. And where do we start? Because I know that there's, our listeners are like, oh my gosh, I'm failing. It's too late. H how do they even begin to start? So before I get to that, there's one more thing I want to say, which which maybe will be in, encouraging to start this conversation. There is a, a, There are a number of studies that research shows that children getting involved in chores is a benefit to their executive functioning and later on to their academic and professional achievements. And so if you needed any more um, sort of reason to get your kids involved in this, um, there's a 75 year a long Harvard study that shows the impact of getting involved in the tasks of home and care and how that has impacted children later on in life and their personal and professional success. Um, but I think the, the first place to start again is really with making this work of home and family more visible. So much of it is, is hidden. And also if you have a lovely person who comes into your home to help with some of this work sometimes, right? The, yeah. your kids don't fully see or connect to it. And so an opportunity to really explain to them all that goes on to make a house work and flow and vibe, and then attaching that value to it, right? The, the reasoning, the why, the impact, the benefit. Um, and then again, as we talked about, like, the energy, making it into uh, a connection between you, forming it into representation of trust and empowerment, explaining to them how it will benefit them later on in life, you know, connecting, teaching your teenager cooking skills to like, you know, a time when they're going to invite a romantic partner over and want to make a meal and like how impactful that might be sort of like extrapolating and looking to the future of, of when they're going to be doing this on their own and how important and meaningful that's going to be to their life. And then again, you go back to like, what, what do you think, you know, given how, given how, you know, you're wired, given how, you know, you thrive, what do you think you want to do around the house? Like what looks interesting yeah. to you? What do you connect with? Like here are all the things that we do. Um, you know, what's your piece of the puzzle that that you think you can fit, right? And so let them know all the things that you think would be appropriate for them to jump into. Explain to them how you will facilitate their learning. And then like report back. How's it been going? Do you do you feel comfortable with this task? Do you need a change? Are you bored of it? Should we do a switcheroo? Um, you know, it, you don't want it to get, you don't want it to feel like overwhelming. Mm -hmm. you, want it, you want to give it to them in small bites and have small wins. Yeah, I love that, you know, and uh, having them, setting them up for success with it. And then coming back and tweaking. It sounds like, you know, if, if you need to. I think we kind of feel like it has, to, it's not working, right? Versus this is going to be a process. And also like, I know you talk a lot about language, right? So 
I love the word support with my kids. Mm. It's a, it's a cousin of help, right? But it's not quite the same. So if I say to my son, you know, um, let me know when you're done with X, whatever the task is that he has at hand. So instead of me saying, do this now, I will say, let me know when you're done. Just so you know, like until you've completed it, I still kind of like feel the weight of it. So when you come back to me and let me know that it's done, I can like fully release it, which is great. And let me know if you need any support. Um, let me know if you can't remember how to do it fully. Let me know if you can't remember where the supplies are happy to like provide any guidance and support. Um, and if you're good, amazing, do it your way and let me know when you're done. And you know, if they don't get it done by the agreed upon time, come back and say, Hey, what prevented that? Like what was going on that? Cause we had an agreement what was going on that prevented that totally get it. When do you think you can deliver on what we agreed to? And can you please let me know? And so it's just, you're still making clear that there are expectations, but you're also making clear that there's an empathy connection to, yeah. you know, where they are at because teens and tweens have so much going on. Right. Yes. And Look, there are certain things, if if the bed isn't made, it really, you know, like you have to decide as your own family, like who cares? Mm -hmm. um, it's less about that and more about the communication and the agreement and being, being comfortable and safe enough to express a struggle when it arises. Mm -hmm. I like that too, because it's so much of uh, tweens and teens. These are, and, and doing this, it's new habits. It's They're new developing habits. new habits. They're they building a muscle. They have, yeah, a lot going on. They're not always really strong with the executive functioning. Their brains aren't fully developed. They are overwhelmed and coming to them and asking those open-ended questions is so much, and listening and, and then saying, how can I support you in this? Is so much more supportive than just the nagging and they're minding or they're getting frustrated, knowing that this is going to be a process for them. And um, also, this is another big thing that came up for me while you were talking was the messy bedroom. You know, moms are always we have we have one meme where it's like a pig laying out by a dumpster, and it's it's something like you know, how are you relating when it comes to your your uh, teen's bedroom. And that's a, that is a big struggle. And so some moms are like, should I just close the door? But you have some good questions when it comes to setting values. Like how do we want our home to feel? Yeah. How do we feel good in our space? So talk a little bit about that. Cause that was also a real mind shift for me. Oh, great. I mean, what we have to recognize is even within our family unit, we are each wired so differently to thrive. And whereas I might be in my type A-ness, you know, I might prefer a really clean and tidy space. My 13, soon to be 14 year old thrives in a different kind of space. He loves to be surrounded by his stuff. He loves the memories. He wants every surface to have something special on it, a trophy, a Lego that he built, a picture frame, something. There's stuff everywhere in his room. And so for me to go into his space and say, no, no, this needs to be put away. Like this is messy. This is whatever. He doesn't see it as messy. For him, it's it's nostalgia. It's warmth. It's connection to all of these memories. And so the standards that we set for his space are based on how he thrives. So we, I help him to be his best self in his best space. So our standards for him are like, okay, we can't have, you know, food under the bed. And he understands why that is. Like we talk about bugs or, you know, stains or whatever it is. And he gets that. But he will say to me, no, I, I want this stuff around me. Like I want the basketball jerseys, like hanging from the corners of the, whatever I, I feel good in this. And I'm like, okay, great. I understand that. And so how, what are the tasks involved in keeping this, your best space 
and also protecting the investment of my home so that, you know, we don't have stains or bugs or whatever that can compromise it. And so he understands that and we, we come to an agreement when you're talking about a shared space, you have to go a little bit deeper to sort of compromise, right? Because in a kitchen or in a living room, the person who really loves things neat and tidy. And then the person who loves things really like maybe cozy and a little bit more lived in kind of have to come together and agree on a minimum standard there. Um, and that's really important for so many tasks in the family that you, you agree to like a minimum, like at, at the very least, when we go to bed at night, like the TV's off, the blankets are folded and there's no dishes in the living room or whatever it is, again, that you've agreed to. And that if it's not being done, you can come back and say, guys, we agreed it was going to be X. We were all at the table when we made that agreement. Like, can you please go in and, you know, make it so. Um, I really and like so, that. Yeah. So just understanding what every family member really needs to thrive and, and, and where they struggle and need support is really, really important. And be, speaking honestly about it. Yeah, I like it because it's sitting down, it's talking about it as a family, it's coming up with those agreements and those values of what really matters, because maybe you're a family that, you know, keeping everything perfect, it just it, that you kind of let that go. It's not yeah. as important, Doesn't but matter. Yeah, yeah, we have to function and there's things that need to get done and not, you know, having time to take care of ourselves in it and not that's feeling huge weight. That's a huge point. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's such an important point. I, I don't want to forget to say so much of this conversation that we've talked about is about, about the tasks and the labor, but what has to come first for your family is an acknowledgement that every family member has the need and the right to equal rest, equal joy, equal time for connection mm -hmm. with friends, equal time for creativity. That balance has to be there as well. And from there, then you have the division of labor that allows for that. And, you know, we were talking a couple of minutes ago about women's wellness and the weight of all of this and the resentment. And so much of that comes from the fact that women actually have five fewer hours of leisure time per week than men. We are not, we don't have those outlets. We don't have the time for creativity for wellness, for rest. And, and that's a huge part of what's missing, which is why we need to shift this paradigm. Wow. Yeah. That this is, I mean, gosh, what a great reframe, you know, and that we all are, you know, we all deserve that. We deserve that. We all, and the more that we can share in contributing in the family, we can have that space to do what we need to do to take care of ourselves. So, so I think you use in different places, you know, the word beautiful, and it really is just a beautiful mind shift. So before we go, I have to ask one more question that comes up all the time. Should we pay our kids to do chores? Mm. That's a biggie. It's a biggie. I think allowance is a really productive concept for financial literacy. I think it's really important for kids to know how to receive, save, spend uh, money, allocate money for, for charitable giving, et cetera. But I think if you have not first instilled an inherent value of this work to the wellness of your family, to the safety of your space, and to the, the, the connection of care to one another, then you've missed a step. Yeah. Oh, really good. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Later so in life, they're not going to be paid to do it. Yes. Yes. So it's so true. Well, and then they can say, I don't care about the money. Right. And then where do you go from there? Right. So right. Important conversation of agreements. And I think it's like, we feel like if we pay them, it's just, we're going to be able to make them. And that's, this is so much more of a relational. Yes. Connecting, yeah. nurturing, nourishing, life-giving approach to how do we create uh just caring for one another in our family and caring for what we have and being, you know, being grateful. And these are life skills that they are going to need to have. 
Yes. Right. And, and so as parents, like it's such an opportunity for us, you know, in addition to teaching them math and spelling, right? It's so important that they learn, you know, whatever their relationship is going to be with food and cooking, you know, however important that is to them and, and keeping spaces clean. Like these are life skills that they're going to take. Um, and it, it relates to their own wellness as well. And so the earlier we can begin having these conversations about the inherent value and the connection to gratitude, the better we're going to be. And if you haven't started this when they're, you know, five to eight years old, which my book addresses, hopefully you can take inspiration from the messages in the book and find your own language based on what you know your kids respond to, to spark the conversations at that stage. Yeah, Lori, this has been so helpful. And we're going to talk about how we can <laughs> we can bring this more to our community with moms uh, that, you know, we need a lot of support in this area. And I just love just talking to you and this mind, you know, this mindset shift. It's been so helpful to me. It's just helped me to be become so much more aware of how I'm holding things in my home. So tell them where they can purchase your book, where they can reach out to you because you offer coaching. Yes. And yeah, tell them all the places. Oh, thank you. So my book, Our Home is available now anywhere books are sold. And um, my website is ourhomeourpride.com. And I should say when I speak about pride, it's not any kind of pride and perfection. It is about a pride in being safe in your own space based on your own values on your own terms without concern of judgment from anyone else. And so my Instagram follows at our home, our pride, and I'm on LinkedIn at Lori Sugarman Lee. I love that. And go to our Instagram. We didn't get to it, but you oh. had the wonderful, I know. I don't, I don't know where that comes from. It's been Let's jumping this up, instead. you know, or this there we go. That's better. Oh, <laughs> is that how you do it? You get it to do? We're making, we're making hearts on the zoom screen for anyone who's, who's listening. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Does that automatically do that? I think zoom senses. Yeah. It has a sensor now for, for basic. You can do a thumbs up. You can do hearts. You can do, Oh, we just did fireworks. Woo! Yeah. This is that really is so cool. cool. This is what a great energy to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lori. And check out our Instagram too, because, um, you had a great list. Maybe I I'll, can even give the link to it. That was just a real mindset shift for me reading it of where to go from this, this mindset to this mindset when it comes to what we've been talking about. So I'll, I'll provide the link. Cause I, oh, I, super. Love, I love that. I printed it out. So thank you again so much for what you're doing and for coming on the show. I loved speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me.